Okay, thanks, Vanessa. And if you can just go to the next slide. So our mission and purpose is that we uh, aim to provide information and support for moms of black sons and also promote positive images of black boys and men. That is the mission of our 501c3 organization, Moms of Black Boys United, and our 501c4, Mob United for Social Change, focuses on influencing policy at the local, state, and federal level that impacts how black boys and men are treated and perceived by law enforcement and society. Next page. We have a five-point approach to how we approach this. Number one is to influence policy. That's the primary work of the 501c4. Two is to change the perception of black males in society. Three is to demonstrate our power. That's politically and economically and in all ways. Four is to partner strategically with like-minded organizations and individuals. And five is uh, to promote self-care so that while we're on this journey, we have fuel for the fight. So that is a brief overview, and now we'll turn it over to Lisa to tell you a little bit about our next chapter development activity. Hi, this is Lisa. Um, basically, we have a pink post. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you. Okay. We've we we were asking our local chapter chapter ladies to host a pink postcard party, which is basically basically going to be um, a brief advocacy training session, as well. Sorry, a brief advocacy training session, and you would host your pink post, pink postcard party. The objectives of this is basically to introduce the organization to your local legislators and councilmen, councilwomen, and also to make a personal connection with your councilmen and legislators. We also want to deliver our key organizational messages to these legislators. Um, Basically, it's a brief, intimate meeting. It's, you're getting together with the ladies that are in your area. If you wanna, if you wanna, um, sorry, if you wanna register for a pink post postcard party, please go out to mobunited.org and go to chapter development. There's a form you can fill out um, and provide your basic information. If you wanna see if there's a meeting in your area please go out to the mobunite.org site and look up events, and you will see all the events that we have planned out there. Next slide. Thank you, Lisa. Um, up next, Chris Baldwin. We have a fundraising drive underway currently for our 501c3, and Chris is going to touch on that briefly. Good morning, Mom. Did you know that black boys represent 16% of enrolled students but make up 20% of all school arrests versus 4.6% of white boys. Moms, did you know that the boys, our boys, represent three out of the four suspensions? Mom, did you know one in four black boys with disabilities have received an out-of-school suspension? For that, that's why we mob. Also, you have to understand that in order for us to fight the fight, it has to be funded. The fight has to be funded. And our fundraising drive helps our moms, the Black Boys United organization, provide resources to help moms advocate for their sons. Please solicit your family and friends, coworkers, and company. Together we can protect them, and we can fuel and fund the fight. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So look out for our fundraising posts on various platforms. Up next, we have Kamari Gafford Davis, who's going to tell you about a number of education and engagement initiatives. Kamari? Star six before you speak, please. Sorry about that. I was talking. <laughs> okay. Good morning, lady. Good morning. So we have definitely been mobbing lately. We've connected with several uh, partners and um, connecting with them to move our mission forward. One of the partners that we've connected with is Dr. Luke Wood, who is a professor of education at San Diego State University. And he has a course called Black Minds Matter, which starts on Monday, and we all need to enroll so that we can learn more about how we can protect our sons. There will be a number of speakers on the Black Minds Matter um, course, and uh, we can go on to jlukewood.com and register. Uh, this course will be from October 23rd to December 11th from 4.30 to 5.45. 
and there's a joint pro um joint program for the PhD program at the school. So I'm hoping that we will all get engaged and we will get involved and um please give us your feedback as well on the um on what you think of the Black Minds Matter on the chat or um connecting with us to let us know what you think. You can also connect with me um at Kamari at mobunited dot dot org. Next slide. We've also been um, connecting with, um, for rapid response, we've connected with school, the school uh, in Claremont, North, 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 I'm sorry, New Hampshire, where there was a biracial child who was almost hung. They hung him by a tree and pushed the table from underneath him. The boys apparently have been saying that it was an accident. They didn't do it on purpose. But we um, put out a rapid response, and we received some feedback from the school and they're requesting for us to come in to offer some trainings and offer some uh, information to them in reference to cultural diversity and sensitivity. So we've already connected with the school district. We've connected with the school board president as well as the uh, superintendent, and we are hoping that we will get feedback from them and we will find out when we're able to move forward with this mission. But thank you so much, ladies, and we'll let you know what's going on further once we have further information. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kamari. So as you can see, we have a lot going on, so please check it out um, on our website within the groups. And, um, you know, we just wanted to give you a brief overview today because we have a very special speaker with a meaty presentation. So I just want to take a few minutes to introduce her, uh, Dr. Rosemarie Allen. She served as an educational leader for more than 30 years. Her life's work is centered on ensuring that children have access to high-quality early childhood programs that are developmentally and culturally appropriate. She is currently an assistant professor in the School of Education at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Her classes are focused on ensuring that teachers are aware of how issues of equity, privilege, and power impact teaching practices. Rosemarie has served in directorship roles with the Colorado Department of Human Services, most recently in the Division of Youth Corrections. As Director of Programs at DYC, she was responsible for the education, health, and mental health of all adjudicated youth in the state. She was also responsible for the professional development of all division staff members in order to ensure statewide cultural change. From 2007 to 2012, Dr. Allen served as the Director of Division of Early Learning. In that role, she oversaw the state's child care licensing program, the Federal Child Care Assistance Program, the redesign of the state's quality rating and improvement system, the implementation of the state's professional development plan, and assisted in the creation of Colorado's early learning guidelines. Dr. Allen recently launched a new nonprofit, Institute for Racial Equity and Excellence, which will serve as the lead agency for ensuring equity and educational practices throughout the nation. In July 2016, Ari was awarded a $1.5 million contract to monitor and license child care centers using a model she created, culturally responsive community-based licensing. Rosemary also serves on, served on President Obama's My Brother's Keeper MBK Initiative, Early Childhood Task Force. She's a national expert on implicit bias and cultural responsive practices, speaking at conferences across the country. She also has the distinct honor of being appointed as a global leader connecting with world leaders in early childhood across the globe. Dr. Allen earned her B.A. from California State University, Long Beach, and her Master's of Education from Lesley University, and a doctorate, doctorate in Equity and Leadership in Education at the University of Colorado, Denver. She's married to Don Allen, and they have two amazing children. Her daughter, Jasmine, is a couples and family therapist in Denver, and her son, Clarence, and this is my favorite part, is a senior at Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, where homecoming is underway today, H.U., with aspirations of attending law school in the fall. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Rosemarie Allen. And Dr. Allen, to speak, you'll have to star six to unmute. Yeah. Please press star six. Oh, I think I know what's wrong. Mm -hmm. There we go. Okay. okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes we can. <laughs> okay, great. Well, thank you so much for the wonderful in introductions. I am really excited to be here. I'm going to be talking about preschool suspensions, but it will tie into everything our children experience from the time they walk through the doors of educational institutions. So first I'd like to 
de um, define what a suspension is. And just basically, it's an action that's administered as a consequence of children's inappropriate behavior. And it requires that the child is not in the classroom or at the school for a period of time. And while we know that to be true, there's things that we call, there are actions we call soft suspensions. First is excluding a child from the learning process. And when we think about children being suspended from school, we have to look at it as being suspended from the learning process. So anytime they're removed, from learning is basically a suspension. And that could be for one or more days. That could be in school where they're excluded from the classroom. They can be out of school where they're excluded from the entire premises. And now, most recently, they're even excluding children from extracurricular activities. And it is when a child is sent home early, when a child is sent to another classroom, and we know that in classrooms across this country or in schools across the country, you can walk through hallways and find little black boys sitting in hallways. And they do that without calling it a suspension, but that child is suspended from the learning process, so we count that as a suspension. And now programs are um, saying they're not suspending children, but they're sending them home, saying that they're not a good fit for the program, or they're telling parents that if you take your child to another school, then a suspension won't be on the records. Because the country is looking at suspensions right now, people are finding very creative ways to exclude children without calling it a suspension. This is especially concerning because when we look at our children, especially black children, we find that we have provided a lot of the data that proves the high quality of the, the cost effectiveness of high quality early childhood programs. For instance, over 40 years ago in the, in the 1960s, I guess 50 years ago, in Michigan, the Perry Preschool study was conducted. And that study was on 100% African American um, children and families. And this is the seminal study that really proved that high quality early childhood programs make a difference in children's lives. And then we have the Abyssidarian study, and the participants were 97% African American. And the Chicago Parent Study, where the children and families were 93% African American. And you may be wondering why that's important for us to know. It's important because, again, we provided the data that proves the benefit of high quality early childhood programs, and they use these studies to get money for funding all across the country. But they do this while now denying African American children access to the very programs that they provided the data for to suspensions and expulsions. And I've spent a good part of my life fighting for high quality education for young children. And now I'm at a point of saying, what good is that if the children who it has proven to benefit the most are denied access to it? So my, my fight now is that let's not use these children's data until we make sure that they're benefiting from it. So the first suspension study was conducted in 1975 by the Children's Defense Fund. In the years following the board versus the Brown versus Board of um, Education decision, the suspension rates for black students tripled compared to whites. After schools were ordered to desegregate, this country experienced suspension rates that were astronomical, where 22 per 100 white students were suspended compared to 76 per 100 black students. So one-fourth of white students were suspended while three-fourths of black students were. Mm -hmm. Studies spanning 40 years show that African-American African children are four times more likely to be suspended than white children. Although a lot of our research focuses on kindergarten through 12th grades, and we talk about the school to prison pipeline, what we haven't looked at very closely is that the entry point to that pipeline is much younger than we ever thought. So we're going to look at some studies for children that are younger than kindergarten age. In 2014, the civil rights data collection showed us um, they, for the first time, included data on children who had been suspended at least once 
who have more than one suspension, who was expelled and who received corporal punishment. I'm just going to throw in here that while we looked at suspension data, we have not fully analyzed the corporal punishment data, but our children are also being beaten at schools at disproportionate rates. Mm -hmm. So what that showed us in the 2014 data collection when it was released, showed us that 2,500 children were suspended, I'm sorry, 5,000 were suspended and 2,500 a second time. African Americans were only 18% of the preschool population, but nearly half of all suspensions, and boys were almost 80% of the preschool population, but 82% of suspensions. Children with disabilities were also disproportionately suspended. So what came out of this were three risk factors for being suspended from school. It was being black, being a boy, and being big. So big black, big black boys are suspended more than anyone else, and they have the greatest risk factors for that. And the 2016 data collection um, data it showed us that boys represented 54% of the preschool population and 78% of those suspended. And again, African-American children nearly four times more likely to be suspended than their white peers. What was very alarming in this release of that data, too, was what's happening to our little girls. Our, our little girls are only 20% of the preschool female population, but more than half of those who are suspended from preschool. And we, we should be concerned about this because this is playing through all the way through 12th grade. English language learners were not disproportionately suspended, but I'm always concerned when they change the, 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 the data points. They did not break this down to Hispanic children, Native Alaskan children, Native American children, Alaskan Native or Native American children. So it made me a little suspicious. So when you look at state studies in Illinois, 40% of the state child, state's child care program suspended infants and toddlers. Now these are children who have not learned to walk or talk. They're still in diapers and they're being kicked out of school. In North Dakota, 20% of programs expelled children, and of those, 53% were infants and toddlers. In 2005, Dr. Gilliam showed us that preschool children were suspended three times more than kindergarten through 12th grades combined. In Colorado, we suspended 10 per 1,000 children. In Boulder, Colorado, 13 per 1,000, but for family child care homes, it was 69 per 1,000. In New Hampshire, 10 per 115. And this was really, really alarming because in Michigan, 27 per 1,000, but that was 34 times the state's rates for kindergarten through 12th grade. So we know that black children are being disproportionately suspended across all grades, but especially in preschool. And it doesn't only occur in suspensions, but disproportionality occurs in classroom discipline. So you'll find that Hakeem's and Tyrone's and Davion's and Trayvon's, their names are being called more. They are being disciplined more. They are being um, praised less. They're being referred to the principal's office more. They're being sent home early more, and they're being sent to other classrooms more. So when we look at this, and we have to say, why is this happening? The, the, the biggest problem with this is not only what it's doing to the child who is being sent home, but also what it's doing to the children who get to stay. Because what we're doing is we are engaging in implicit bias. First, teachers feel that they don't have the tools to address challenging behaviors in the classroom. But my question when teachers tell me this is always, who's being challenged? Who's exhibiting the challenging behavior? Is it the child or are the adult responses to the child's typical behaviors? And I always hear that, especially in Colorado this past legislative session, we tried to pass a bill to ban preschool suspensions, and the teachers kept saying, that's a tool in our toolbox. And my question is, is it a tool or is it a weapon? And it's a weapon because it's used to really destroy our black boys. It's a weapon to destroy our children. It's a weapon to perpetrate implicit bias. It's a weapon to exclude our children from the learning process, and we need to have better tools. 
and that the, whatever tools we use, we have to understand that they're being used through the framework of implicit bias. And I explain implicit bias by using this ladder of inference. And whenever you climb a ladder, you start at the bottom, of course. You select data. You add meaning that's based on your cultural and personal experiences. You make assumptions that's based on the meanings that you added. You draw conclusions. You adopt beliefs about the world. And then you take actions based on those beliefs. So I use this again to have a visual for implicit bias because it takes milliseconds. Um, it's a process that most people don't know they're engaging in. And this is what it can look like. First, I observe data. Rosemary pushes past me without speaking. And I also let teachers know that speaking is cultural. There are many of us on this call right now who were taught to speak when you walk in a room. We were explicitly taught when you walk in a room, you say hello. If I walk into my grandmother's house, I say, hello, Auntie Pam, hello, Auntie Trina, hello, Auntie Nat. And I don't say hello, but, but hug each one of them. It's cultural. But then I'm going to add meanings based on my own culture and personal experiences. Huh. Rosemary has an attitude. I know she didn't like me. And then I'm going to make assumptions. Huh. She thinks she's better than us. Who does she think she is? And then I'm just going to draw conclusions. We'll never be treated fairly by her because she didn't speak. And this happens in seconds without us understanding or even knowing it. Let's look at another one. I select data. Huh. That child didn't say Ms. Allen, or that person didn't address me by Dr. Allen. Because again, titles are very cultural. We are taught, many of us on this call, that anyone taller than, than us have a title. Mr., Ms., teacher, auntie, someone. And then we add meaning and labels based on our own cultural and personal beliefs. I think that's disrespectful. And then we make assumptions. That family, that, that child, comes from a family that doesn't value manners, they don't value education, and then we draw conclusions. I make less of an effort to get to know this child as a person. And actually, and I'm going to ask you to mute your phone so that we don't get that echo, if you don't mind. Thank you. So I'm going to um, just tell you what happened to me as I went up this ladder of inference when I started working at a predominantly white school. Um, in my family and culturally, when I'm called by an adult, I come. So if my dad says, Rose, I'm on my way. And if I can't make it, I say, coming. So when I was working at the school and I called this little guy, Connor, I said, Connor. He goes, what? And I was shocked. I thought perhaps he made a mistake. And I said, Connor. He goes, what? And I'm thinking, surely this little boy is not answering me what. I said, Connor. He goes, what, teacher? What do you want? Why do you keep calling my name? There was a cultural disconnect between me and that child, and I thought that was very disrespectful. And that was just the way that he answered his family and his home. So what we know is that implicit racial bias is one of the critical factors that promotes inequality in our society today. But we have to understand what causes it, and then we have to do intentional work so that we can mitigate these negative consequences. And when I say we, it's those of us who are in positions of power and authority, and the, the onus on the rest of us as parents is to make sure that teachers understand when they engage in that. And I'll show you what we need to do, because this is how it starts. There are negative symbolic symbols and attitudes. The media is showing black men and boys in such negative ways, and our research bears that out, that black boys are thought to be bigger, taller, more violent across the board. They just conducted, not just, but recently conducted a study on white children, and they felt that black children even felt less pain than they do. Then we have the racial bias. Then the racial um, stereotyping and prejudice, discrimination, and then the inequality and injustice. And this middle um, section right here, unconscious attitudes are less egalitarian than what we explicitly think about race. The problem is that people don't believe that they are racist. People believe they are without bias, and they believe that their, their attitudes are far better than they think. So 
it is a mental process and it results in feelings that's based on age, race, and appearance. And it's unconscious. And these biases develop over the course of our lifetime. And I want you to think about this course of our lifetime because I just showed you that children are being suspended and expelled from school very early while they're still in diapers, especially our black boys. So when you look at that, when you look at who is excluded and who is included, children in the classroom learn very quickly who's dispensable and who's not. Because imagine the children playing at a, in the block area. They're playing with blocks. They're all throwing blocks. But Hakeem is sent out of the classroom for throwing blocks. All the other children in that classroom begin to learn that Hakeem is dispensable. I had a white teach a white parent come to me after a lecture and she said, Rosemary, my teach my daughter's teacher is teaching her that black boys are bad. And as always I said, Tell me more. And she said, at first she used to come home and say, Tyrone got in trouble today. Hakeem got in trouble today. Davion got in trouble today. She said, now she's coming home saying, Tyrone is bad. Hakeem is bad. Davion is bad. So those children in that classroom are learning very early, before they're out of diapers, that black children are bad. And we have to remember that children are going to learn in whatever context and in whatever environment they're in. And as they learn and grow, those, what we said right here, those biases will develop over the course of their lifetimes. So when they are being taught bias at two, these are the same children who grow up to be police officers. These are the same children who grow up to be doctors, who grow up to be judges, who grow up to be prosecutors. And that level of bias started in that preschool environment when they were very, very young. So many early childhood teachers, preschool teachers, don't want to believe that they're biased because we all go into this field to really help children. But how does this impact the preschool classroom? Just last year, Walter Gilliam conducted a study and found that preschool teachers judge children's behavior differently based on the race of the child. While that's no, no surprise to us, it's great to have the evidence. So he asked preschool teachers to, vid, show, to view a video clip of four children, a black girl, a black boy, a white girl, a white boy. They were all child actors. And they were asked to look at the clip to try to determine behaviors that might be challenging. What these teachers didn't know was that their eyes were being tracked and all the children in that video clip were child actors and there were no, no um, challenging behaviors. And what was found was that the black boy was watched more than any other child. And what was really alarming is that almost half the teacher said that he required more of their attention than any other child. The black girl was watched more often than the white children, white children less than black. And these results were true with both black and white teachers. And one of the things that we have to talk about is how implicit bias impacts all of us. You know, when people come up and talk about um, black cops shoot black men too, first, we're all impacted by implicit bias. Secondly, we are dealing with very racist systems and institutions that needs to be addressed as well. So this is my son, and his name is Clarence Allen III. And Clarence was my ninth pregnancy, and I only have two children. So I lost lots of babies getting this one here. And he is the hope and dream for our family for generations. I was 35 when he was born. My husband was 45. My husband's the youngest in his family. So we were, were depending on this child to carry on our family name. Um, like I said, he was this child, the child who was prayed for, hoped for, dreamed for. By the time he was this age, if you look at this um, picture, he's holding a red Lego. This baby had to take this Lego everywhere he went, to the dinner table, to the bathtub, to the car seat, everywhere. Now imagine if a teacher took this red Lego, because can't you imagine a teacher saying, we don't bring toys to the table? He would have had a serious meltdown, and chances are he could have been suspended. 
He was also diagnosed around this time with sensory integration processing disorders, which made him very sensitive to touch, loud noises, visual cues, and everything. So this baby, who was longed for, prayed for, hoped for, is at high risk for being suspended and kicked out of schools. This is him a little bit older as he went through some of the special ed programs. And this is him now. My um, bio said he was a senior at Howard, but he actually graduated in May. This was his graduation party. He's at homecoming right now. He went back as an alumni, very excited. And I show this at all my presentations because we have to help these teachers humanize our children. They have to know the backstory because the reality is that every one of us, love our babies as much as I love mine. Even though he, it took a while for him to get here, he's no less loved than anybody else's or more loved than anybody else's. We all want what's absolutely right, good, and best for our kids. But what we have to help people understand is that they have hot buttons. And sometimes the hot buttons of teachers are connected to culture and create cultural disconnects. So let me show you what, I'm, what I mean. Most children don't come to school knowing what teachers expect of them. For many of our children, when they enter preschool, early childhood, it's the first time being away from family. And teachers are not aware of the cultural expectations and norms of the child's home. And the experience that families have may be totally different from the experiences of the teachers. Um, I said earlier that one of my, um, one of a parent called me last week because her child was going to be kicked out of school because he kept crying. The child's three years old, the second week of school. They're crying because they've never been away from the family, but the principal's going to kick the child out of school for crying, which is typical for a child who's three years old. And what happens when a three-year-old is kicked out of school or a nine-month-old or a one-year-old? What what happens, just in this case with the three-year-old, the mother's called to pick the child up. The child is now kicked out of school. The child gets to stay home. That child is now rewarded for crying. Now, because they cried and they got to be at home, which is where they wanted to be anyway, now they're at risk for future suspensions. And this is how it works. I cry, I get to go home. Okay, I'm rewarded. I go back to school. I cry. And then they don't call my mother. I cry some more. I cry some more. Okay, that didn't work. Now I'm going to throw a block. I get to go home. The biggest risk factor for being suspended is having been suspended before. And something as simple as crying because you miss your mom can set a child up on a downward trajectory for being suspended throughout the course of their academic career. And let's look at another situation that's not crying, but um, as someone mentioned earlier, a child was sent out of the classroom because someone tripped them and then they kicked them back. So a child is hit and then they hit back. The child who did the hitting is not sent home. So what does that do for that child? While they watch the child who hit them back go home. When that happens time after time after time, children know that school is not a safe place for them especially when they have black skin. So a lot of times these children have been misused over and over and over again. They're told to, they can't go outside for recess. They can't go on a field trip. They, 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 they can't stay in their room. And they know it's unfair because they see their peers who do the same thing that can stay. And then all of a sudden they're in middle school. They're really resentful of school. They've disengaged from the learning process. And many of us as parents don't know that because they don't see all of those subtleties that have happened over years. And when our children say things like, Mom, everybody else does it and they're not getting in trouble, we have to believe them because the data is telling us that what they're saying is true. These disconnects lead to disproportionate disciplinary practices. And we have to help teachers understand that different is not deficit. We had another situation where um, boys were playing basketball um, on the playground and white teachers thought they were being aggressive 
and they were sending them to the principal's office until we sent a team in to really look at what was going on. And they were playing street ball. They were playing ball like they play at home. They weren't playing by school or MBA rules, but white teachers became afraid because they saw it as aggressive and there was a cultural disconnect. Different is not deficit, it's different, and we have to help teachers understand that difference. Because culture, our culture impacts the way we live, our values, mores, and customs, our behavioral expectations, belief systems, just the way we communicate. Um, the communication styles is another point where teachers get mixed up, where boys especially, they can be rambunctious and push and shove and talk about each other and be loud and be seen as aggressive when it's just their way of communicating. So culture can impact the way the children learn, cope, solve problems, and communicate. The way that we solve problems, the way we cope, the way we learn, the way we move while we're learning. I always tell um, teachers that children don't have to be still to learn, and sometimes being still impedes learning. I have ADHD, my son has, and my daughter have it. And this is what it looks like in an ADHD brain when you're being told to sit down or be still. I'm being still, but my brain is going, okay, don't move, don't move, don't move, don't twist. You're rocking your leg, don't shake your leg. Uh oh, you're tapping your pencil, don't tap your pencil. There's so much self talk going on that I can't hear a thing anybody else is saying because I'm focused too much on being still. So we have to help teachers understand how our children learn because when we view them through their own learning context and cultural context, then it can provide an understanding of factors that influence behaviors and learning. We have to be aware of how culture, how everywhere we go, there's a culture that exists and schools are built on white middle-class norms, the culture we bring and then a culture that we can create. The culture that we bring is our beliefs our, and our perceptions, what I told you and showed you through that ladder of inference, our own personal identities. And studies show that black boys with strong black identities fare worse at white schools than black boys, especially white affluent schools, than black boys who do not have a strong identity, which is very interesting. And then we bring with us our cultural practices. Um, some of you may have seen the iceberg theory of culture. I like to use the tree because our roots run deep. And what we see when we look at culture is the way we dress, our music, our food. But what we really don't talk about and people have no idea about are our habits and our assumptions, our understandings, values, and judgments, our nature of friendships. Um, my children have lots of aunties and uncles simply because those people are my good friends their dad's good friends, tone of voice, people who are loud versus people who are soft-spoken. And when I talk about tone of voice, another cultural disconnect that I see are what I um, call coded languages, coded directives. There are some teachers who grew up in households where if it was time for them to go to bed, their parents may say, oh, honey, do you think it's time to go to bed? And that teacher understands that that really means it's time to go to bed. But for children who grew up in a home where the parents say, honey, it's time for bed, go brush your teeth, wash your face, and I'll be in there in a minute, that's different. So teachers who grow up being asked questions rather than given directives, when they're in the classroom, they ask children questions. I'll give you an example. I, I went in to observe a little black girl named Rebecca who was a terror in her classroom. I was watching my student teacher, and Rebecca was throwing toys, taking books, doing everything. And my student teacher kept saying, Rebecca, do you think it's okay to take so-and-so's toy? Rebecca, do you think you should use your words? Rebecca, how do you think so-and-so feels when you hurt them? And Rebecca didn't pay her any attention. But my student teacher came to me and said, see, Rosemarie, she's so disobedient and disrespectful, she won't do anything I tell her. And I had to point out to the teacher that she didn't tell her anything. She asked for her opinion on everything. And she said, well, what do I do? So I showed her. By this time, Rebecca's looking at me, and she's getting this idea that I have a little bit of authority. And she came over, and she offered me a block that she had just taken from another child. She said, teacher, you want this block? And I said, no, Rebecca, I don't. But what I want is you to go give it back to the child you took it from.
And she marched right over there and gave it back. So these, this coded language can be very, very confusing for our children, especially our strong-willed warriors who respect authority. So we don't talk about tone of voices or coded language. Attitude towards elders, concepts of cleanliness, how we make decisions, and our preference for competition or cooperation. We sometimes talk about concepts of time, personal space. Personal space is huge for our children. One of the things that you can count on being a trigger is somebody stepping in their face and then the reflex to push them away. But that's a different topic. Rules of conduct, facial expressions, nonverbal communication. So my question is, and what can we do to address this issue? And at this time, I'd like to open it up for questions, feedback. Well, first of all, before we do that, I just want to thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. It's very enlightening, and you brought out a lot of insights that I'd certainly never thought of. I always thought about the impact on the child, this being disciplined, but not so much about the impact that has on the perceptions that other children in the class have of those children who, um, you know, are overly punished and disciplined. So thank you so much. And now um, we want to open it up for Q&A. Chris, if you're on, press star six. We have a couple of questions in the chat. Hi, this is Chris Baldwin. Um, I, I'm, first of all, I'm just blown away. Thank you, uh, Dr. Allen, for everything. Um, one of my questions I had is in terms of, as a parent, how do you convey and communicate uh, to administrators, teachers? Because, you know, oftentimes, you know, they've been in their profession for 20 years, so mm -hmm. where they've never been told that when you – isolate my child or when you target them, you're creating um, biases through their peers so that where they'll say, oh, if I just want to get rid of this kid, if I want to just get rid of Gabriel, then, you know, I just need to do this and the teacher will basically essentially give me my wish. Like, oh, I just want to get, you know, sent out the class. How do you how did you tell your teachers that they're basically creating your child to be a mark? And and this is where we this is the dilemma of black women. First, fighting that stereotype of the angry black woman, right? Mm -hmm. So we can't we we don't want to feed into that because then they shut down and they don't hear us. But what they will respect is some of the research and something coming from someone other than you. It's unfortunate. But I believe we need to start off by saying, will you, will you take a look at this article and tell me what you think? You can do that. But also you can say, when you send my child out of the classroom, what do you think happens to the other children? And or I notice, and sometimes you have to say it in a way that is just to the point, I notice that the children in my child's classroom is starting to te treat him the same way the teacher treats him, that they're learning how to treat him from the teacher, that my child's name is called more than any other child's name in this classroom. What do you think happens? That the other children are learning that he's the problem. If I can be very candid, as a teacher, when I was younger, I did that. I had a child named Connor that I actually could not stand, and I'm going to be really honest, and I found that I caught that child's name all the time, and it didn't hit me what I did to, in terms of um, influencing the other children until one day it was a big ruckus in one part of the room, and I asked what was going on, and they said Connor did it, and Connor wasn't even there that day. <laughs> and I realized I did that. So I think helping to bring that awareness and always saying it from the point of view of what's happening to the other children because they, they turn a blind ear to our concern about our child, but show concern about every child in the classroom. I'm concerned about how every child here is learning how to treat him, how every child here is now learning that not only my son but boys who look like him 
are the ones who are, who are who are the troublemakers. What can we do to build a more equitable classroom so that children understand that all children are valued in your room? Does, does that help? Yeah. It, wow. Thank you. So I have a follow-up question to that, um, just in terms of sharing the data. Mm -hmm. How do you do that? <laughs> like, at what point do you think this is something we should share in the moment, like when something is happening to your child? Do you think it's better to be proactive and share some of this data in advance? So, like, how do you do it without being offensive in terms of, um, you know, presenting this kind of data to teachers? Thank you so much, and I believe that it starts very, very early, very early in the school year. Um, it's the same way I do when before Black History Month ever comes, the beginning of the school year. I say, you know what, I, I'm in this program, or I've just learned this, or I just read this. Not that I think it'll ever be a problem here, but I just wanted to share this with you because it blew me away, and I thought you would be interested, just as, as sharing. You know, having a black boy and seeing what's happening in the media, um, I, I, I'm going to assume that you know all this, but here are some one-pagers that I found that shows how black children are treated at school. And, and you may already know this, but here's just one page if you want to share it with your, with your colleagues. And to do that at the very beginning of the school year, um, really our job, unfortunately, is to help teachers understand who our children are. And the one thing that I'm going to encourage us to never, ever, ever do, and I see it done all the time, is to set our boys up by asking teachers if they did anything wrong that day or by telling them stuff like, well, you know, this is my son, Clarence, and he has a tendency to be a little active. And if you find that, just give me a call. Parents with the best intentions begin to set teachers up to look for negative behavior in their children because they said that you can expect it. And if you see it, let me know. So what we're telling them to do is look for it. Does that make sense? So we want to make sure we're not doing that, but we're being proactive by saying, you know, being a mom of a black boy, I do a lot of reading. Here's some things that you might want to know if you don't know already. But begin to do that before any problems ever come up. That's a great idea. Thank you. Just on your last point, I did that unconsciously in terms of uh, sending positive messages. We had to fill out a form for kindergarten just for the teachers to get to know our children. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the form, I wrote, Grant is a wonderful child, and I hope you will enjoy him as much as we do. Yes. Nice. Uh -huh. All the positive, so they, they can look for that positive behavior. Even little things like, um, you know, my, my child loves bugs and we think he's going to be a scientist and we hope that you will develop that in him. You know, mm -hmm. anything that will help them look at that child's brilliance before they ever have a chance to define him or her by her, their behavior. Thank you. Um, I have another question from the queue. What does it, what do you mean by, uh-oh, Sorry about that. What do you mean by, um, you know, when you say that some of our boys have a strong black identity, how does that manifest or appear at school? Um, I'll, I'll use my own son as an example. He was very proudly and boldly black. He wore his locks. He wore his T-shirts with messages on them. Every assignment that he did was connected to his culture somehow. He was a proud black man. Um, he he took pride in, 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 in his blackness. So I think that black identity that I'm black and I'm proud and my people have a strong history, it shows up in, in their way of being. Um, and those children are the ones who are not doing as well as opposed to those who assimilate more who don't speak up more, who, who don't talk about being black, who you wouldn't know were black unless you looked at them, that they tended um, to do better in school because they assimilated more. They were easy um, for teachers to deal with. Yeah. I, I, I'm hoping that makes sense. No, it, it, it absolutely makes sense. Now, okay. my, my follow-up thought in my head is then how do we strike the balance by – 
allowing or encouraging our children to be proud of their black history and share it whenever they can, but not having it interfere or potentially interfere with their education. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's quite the dilemma. You know, my son now being um, almost 23, he talks about what it was like to go to this affluent white school and what it did to him. And, but he also understands that, Mom, I know that I had to get the best education and had I gone to the school in the city, you know, that had inferior equipment and, you know, all of the other stuff we have to deal with that our people deal with in inferior schools. And he said, but sometimes I have, to, when I think about having children, I wonder what I will do because when he graduated from that school, his GPA was a 2.7. But what we did, we concurrently enrolled him in the community college. And I don't know how many of our people know to do this. When your children are in high school, as much as you can, concurrently enroll them in community college because those college credits count towards high school credits. And they can enter college almost with, what, 24 credits, 34. My son had 24 credits. They can go in almost as juniors. But his college credits... Afford, um, he got a much higher GPA, which is what got him into Howard. And Howard, he graduated magna cum laude and is doing great because he was able to flourish there. But you're right in, in trying to attain that balance without them losing who they are. Mm -hmm. um, and, and we have to tell them that sometimes it is a game. And, and you have to be aware of who your audience is at all times. Mm -hmm. You know, I have a, the, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll wait till you're done. I'm sorry. I, no, I was just thinking. My my son and I are martial artists, and you know, I raised him to be a warrior. And but what we had to do when he got older and driving, we had to practice unlearning some of the muscle memory. Like for instance, if the police ever put him in a chokehold, we had to promise making practice making practice him going limp rather than instinctively fighting because we wanted him to come home. You know what I mean? Um, and, and, and we have this dilemma of, of creating strong black men, but at times giving them the tools they need to come home or to graduate or to stay safe. Uh, Dr. Allen, I have another question for you, um, just kind of skewing a little bit older maybe, at what point do you think is a, a, a good point for you to start uh, engaging with your teacher, with your uh, son's teachers on identifying um, where they, there might be challenges? Because if, you, if your suggestion is not to set the teacher up to look for these um, challenging behaviors, how how do you approach it to, to kind of have a, if you want to have a watchful eye on, on where your child is, is going? Um, are you talking about behaviors or, or, or learning? Behaviors. behaviors. Um, I, I think we will, we will pick up on some of that. I think if the teacher comes in and says, you know, um, so-and-so is hitting, you always ask, ask for the context, you know, always Tell me what happened. What tell me what happened from the very beginning? Um, we we got a call once that my son was being detained for not paying for a soda in the um, cafeteria. Right? Of course, we knew that that didn't happen. That kid wouldn't take a hundred dollars sitting on a ledge, you know, outside. But when we got there, and I asked the teacher, the cafeteria worker, tell me what happened. And she said, well, you know, he got to the register and he wasn't going to pay. I said, no, 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 please tell me, but go back as far as you can remember. And she said, well, I saw him when he got in line. He had a book and he had his hat on. And one of the other students had to tell him to take his hat off. And he took it off and he put it under his arm. Then he got two pizzas. And then he got a soda. And when he got the soda, he put it under his arm. And then I said, well, why did he put it under his arm? What what happened that caused him to do that? Well, he was getting ready to press in his code. And I said, his code to pay? Yes, but he wasn't going to pay for the soda. I know he wasn't because he put it under his arm. But is it possible he put it under his arm because he had to press the code since you saw he had two pizzas in the other hand? 
Anyway, after all that, I said, you said you noticed my son when he got in line. Why? She goes, what do you mean, why? I said, you have 2,500 students at the school. Why did you notice him? Not only did you notice him, but you noticed every move he made. And then I gently said, I, I think when you notice my son that you made an assumption of positive or negative intent and whatever assumption you made played out here today. So why am I sharing that story? Because so many times we'll get reports of behaviors of our children and we don't know the context and we can't address a problem if it's not delivered in the context of that problem. So I think the way that we start first is to understand the context. And then if the context tells us there may be some um, opportunities for learning, then we do that because all behavior sends a message. So if you find that your child is actually fighting a lot at school, we have to find out why. I, I was working with another family. The child kept getting out of his seat, and the mother was so concerned. Why won't he sit down? Why won't we, he sit down? And it took us forever to realize that the reason he kept got, getting out of his seat was because he was sitting next to two white girls who kept patting his afro, and he said he was tired of being petted like a puppy. So um, finding out the causes of the behavior, the context of the behavior, and then if it's truly a behavioral issue, is to not to frame it as problematic behavior, but frame it as an opportunity to t teach some pro-social skills. So still, whatever we're dealing with with that teacher is positive. Your child's hitting and he's pulling hair or he's cussing. Oh, it, it sounds to me like we need to do some environmental work, but we also need to provide the child with some skills to handle this type of um, anger to hire, to handle this type of challenge. But because of implicit bias and the negativity associated with the perceptions of our boys, everything that we do, we have to come from a positive point of view. Yeah, I just have a, um, a comment. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Kamari. How you doing? Hey, Kamari. Um, my 10-year-old, uh, um, we had a lot of challenges last year in the fourth grade. Uh, we had a teacher that uh, would make negative comments to him all the time. And although, you know, Ethan is, you know, he can challenge me a lot as his mom, which most 10-year-olds do, he's mm -hmm. very respectful of authority always. And we know him to be that kind of kid. And this particular teacher, um, it wasn't that his behaviors were an issue. He was struggling in math, and she would make derogatory comments towards him, um, she would call him out in class, and she said to him once, uh, you know that, you're, that math is not your strong suit, so you need to pay attention. Oh, uh, when he would ask her, you know, because I would always encourage him to go to her and ask questions before I realized that this is really the issue with her. Um, and he would go to her and ask her questions, and she said to him, uh, you need to stop being so needy. Um, and, it, and, and it's really um, it was very discouraging for him. And I ended up finally going to the principal because I noticed that my child who loves to socialize and loves to talk to everyone and, and loves everyone, he started, I, I saw him dimming. Like I literally could see the light dimming. And um, I went to the principal and ex expressed my concerns. Um, the principal knows Ethan very well as, as well because Ethan's a part of the leadership team in the school. So um, he offered to move him out of her class, and which finally did happen. And then we saw him again being bright again. We saw him being the Ethan that he normally is. But um, I just wanted to just point out that I know that a lot of times it has to do with behaviors, but even with the academic portion of it, um, because he was struggling, she would call him out. She would make him feel bad about himself. Um, and he noticed that the kids were treating him differently. Um, there was one kid that said to him, I'll always be smarter than you in math because I'm white. There was another child that said to him, um, um, we'd call him dummy every day. And uh, it, it just really started to wear on his spirit. Like I can literally mm -hmm. see it in his face every time he would come home. He hated fourth grade. So um, I know that in terms of us advocating for our children, it should always be in that context of, you know, in terms of um, behaviors. But in terms of academics, we had to, like, work something out with the school because this teacher obviously had a problem. I think I mentioned to the group where he called her mommy once, which – he, at the time he was nine, which nine-year-olds do, and she mm -hmm. said, I, I'm not your mother, I'm not that dark. So we realized at one point I mean, it, it was race that was an issue. You know, at first we tried to give her the benefit of a doubt, 
But um, it's just so it, it's so discouraging when you have to deal with that with your child and that you have to have these conversations with your child about how you're not doing anything wrong, sweetie. She just has an issue because of color. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's, it's so unfortunate because I literally can see this, my child dimming when I know that that's not the kind of kid that he is. And, um, and I'm, I'm very encouraged by your um, presentation because I recognize that. And actually, while we were presenting, I asked him, I said, did you notice the kids were treating you differently? Like, I knew about the comments the little boy made about being white, but he said he noticed the kids were talking to him differently and treating him differently in the classroom. And, and he would come home every day telling me how he had no friends in the class. And that was very discouraging for me. So um, thank you so much for your presentation and really opened my eyes even with, to what we were dealing with. It made me think even more of what I could be doing to help him in this situation, being that it is a very, very small portion of uh, minority students in the school that he, that he attends. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Let me tell you that one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this topic is because I was that kid. I was suspended. I don't know if any of you have seen my TED Talk, but I was suspended seven, eight, nine, ten times a year from the time I started school and was actually kicked out of three schools. It's amazing that I've ended up where I am. But the thing that got me through, people always ask me, how did you get through? Because my family. My daddy believed in me. He went to bat for me. I mean, he made me understand that I was brilliant, that I was smart, but I was misunderstood. So what you just said about your 10-year-old son, first I have to say it breaks my heart. Um, My nephew was told that he just wasn't good at math and that just wasn't going to be his strong point. And we went there in all of our blackness and said, how can you tell this child that he wasn't good at math when his people created the basis for math? in the world and you need to look up history and if you saw him as the scientist and the mathematician that he is based on who his people are then he would look at himself differently and you would too and it just comes a time where the battle to get them to see our children positively can become so weary the fatigue that we experience but we can never give up and like I said we have to stay positive and we have to build our children up even sometimes telling them that the teacher is wrong yeah exactly thank you I agree and we went and we went in there strong too all of us went in there strong I agree yeah uh we have another question actually two people asked this same question um can you elaborate on infant toddler suspension um, how much does the parent's personality or response contribute? And also, um, another part of that question separately was, how does one, like, what behaviors are exhibited that, in an infant that would make a teacher want to suspend or expel them? <laughs> it's puzzling, isn't it? The number one um, behavior that we're seeing is biting. And um, all children bite because that's what infants do. That's their job. But black boys are sent home more. And um, it's not all, well, what, what I'm seeing more often than not is the teachers are responding to the other parents. Where if a, for instance, a little white girl is bitten by another little white girl, it's not as big a deal as if the little white girl was bitten by a little black boy. Because then the the parents, I'm going to pull them out, you got to stop this. They see it as more egregious, and that's consistent with research because any, I mean, our children, they don't have the, um, the, the, the freedom of being kids, of being babies who bite. So mostly the biting. The parents, I haven't seen anything around how the parents' um, behavior. The person who called me last week, she was one of those parents, what can I do? Can you tell me how to stop him from crying? I can't afford for them to be kicked out. I had another parent call me, her eight-month-old. She said that she keeps pulling the teacher's hair. Anybody ever have an eight-month-old? You know they pull hair. They pull earrings. They pull everything. They're grasping. That's what they do. It's developmentally appropriate. But this parent was told if her baby didn't stop pulling the teacher's hair, she was going to be kicked out. And my concern in terms of parental behavior is, let me give you an example. When that woman said, I don't want to spank her, 
but she's got to stop pulling hair because I don't want her kicked out. So what I'm finding is that these parents will do whatever it takes to keep their children in school so they're, they're cooperating with the teachers to the point where a mother is thinking about spanking her eight-month-old for doing what eight-month-olds do. So some of this is lack of... Um, lack of awareness around what's developmentally appropriate, and a lot of it is bias. To look at an eight-month-old black boy who put your hair as violent rather than being an eight-month-old who's developing is, is a real issue. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, Dr. Allen. This is Nike Vassar. Um, again, like everyone else said, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, you spoke a lot about, you know, preserving and protecting cultural expression and cultural freedom while, you know, promoting assimilation and how important that balance is. Mm -hmm. I work a lot with um, moms, um, parents who are on the lower economic scale, and so it's oftentimes harder for them to advocate for their, um, their children, their sons in particular, as opposed to just going with the flow. But what I also find is in the classroom, we don't really know how to talk to non-black parents about what our child is doing and feeling comfortable with it. Like when you were talking about your son and you're, you're like your son was just confident in his blackness. And I, when I see that, I, I, I tend to marvel at that when I see that at any age. But I also see a lot of times parents justifying it or explaining it away to non-black parents as if they have to. And so how can we start to build those conversations where we're not apologizing for who we are, no matter how much our blackness may come across, especially as it relates to those who are on the lower social or economic scale who may not feel as comfortable or as confident. Oh, that's, that's such a dilemma. And the first thing that popped into my head when you asked that was, it's a black thing you just wouldn't understand. You remember that? <laughs> you, yes, you I remember. remember. <laughs> yes. You know, yes. that. That, that was the first thing, but I think right. um, just if I could say this, because we're all on this together, in this together, is we have work to do with our schools, and then we have a lot of work to do amongst ourselves. We have right. to, you know, we, we, we have to, I'm, I just put in a grant for some, 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 some parenting stuff in terms of talking about who we are as parents, how we show up as parents, how we promote our kids as parents. And I think that's what we're going to really have to talk to our families about because sometimes who we are when we enter these institutions, sometimes it can bring us shame and we do try to explain it away. And and we confuse the heck, of, uh, heck out of our kids. I worked in Compton for a lot of years, and I saw people transition. I go to doctor's appointments and stuff like that and try to become somebody different. And the kids are like, right. Mama, Mama, why are you talking like that? <laughs> Mama, <laughs> right. Mama, you know, Mama, what, what, why are you acting like that? How come you moving like that? And the kids are now confused. <laughs> And right. what they, that does is that creates shame for who you are. We don't want to teach our kids to be duplicitous. You know, we talk right. a lot about code switching. Code switching should be a personal, very personal decision. But our kids shouldn't have to. You know what I mean? Absolutely. They yep. should not okay. have to lose who they are when they step into these schools, but they should be promoted. I do a lot, and I know, Kamara, you do too, on... <coughs> excuse me, on culturally responsive practices and creating a school where every child feels welcome. You know, I was called once because my daughter was playing church, but they didn't know she was playing church. And she jumped up at circle time and started doing, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. And they called me thinking she was having spasms. And we had to do a whole lesson. This is the type of church she goes to. She's perfectly okay. She's just playing church. You know what I mean? So I, I think we, we have yes. to do a lot of work with our families, too, and giving them the right. supports they need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just learned how to look through the chat. <laughs> so oh, great, great, great. Yeah, there um I think I have another question. Oh, um, there was another question about defensiveness. 
How uh, it was relating back to uh, the story that you were telling us about uh, stealing the, the alleged stealing of the soda, and it was um, how do you deal with it, uh, the, the defensiveness of a person who, you know, when you um, when you start asking questions, they like really fire back at you and they get defensive while you're just trying to uh, show them reason and logic behind what your child may have done. Without that, is, yeah. that is such a great question. And one of the things I learned very early is that the person who asks the most questions is the one who's controlling the conversation. And always start with questions. And if you notice, I said, can you tell me what happened? Please tell me when you first noticed him. And framing those questions in a way that says, um, I could have said, why did you notice him? Why? Why did you notice him? Is it because he's black? But I didn't. I said, you, you told me that you noticed him when he first got in your line. Can you tell me why? You see, and to pose it in a way that kind of um, neutralizes that defensiveness because you're just asking. And when they get all upset, because actually when I said, can you tell me why, that was the question that sent her over the top. And what do you think she started doing? <laughs> Crying. And I get so tired of being manipulated by white tears, I can't even tell you how much. Um, so anyway, that's another topic, <laughs> um, to, is to ask the questions and say, oh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not trying to, um, you know, to, to do whatever. I'm just trying to understand. You told me that my child did this, and I'm just trying to understand so I know how to handle this at home. You know, in a way that kind of neutralizes it. I hope that answers it. I mean, I, I have just developed a way of dealing with them anytime. When my daughter was got in trouble about parking her car in the teacher parking lot, and I said, well, of course she shouldn't have been parking her car in the teacher parking lot, but I said, I wonder why she keeps doing this. And it was the principal who said, I think it's because her parking lot that she pays for is across, you know, across the field, and these are empty. And I said, I wonder why we would have empty lots right here and not let students park and make them walk across a field when they're paying the same amount of money, no matter where it is. And then, you know, she gave my child a parking space right there on a teacher lot. But it was just asking that question without being defensive. So I think asking questions rather than assuming, yeah. And Adana says she uses it at work. It really does work when you just begin to ask in a way that, um, that, that's soft. And I hate that we have to do this, but sometimes we have to just to be heard. Right. Hi, this is Tiffany. She said, a question. Okay. Ho Tiffany, hold on one second. I see that Go Brenda ahead. said, but holding my emotions and tongue can be hard when their bias is so obvious. Mm -hmm. It is so mm -hmm. hard, but remember, and, and this is what I've learned because, I, like I told you, I've been kicked out of so many schools. I learned how, that there is so much strength and power and restraint because, and let them commit the second foul. We don't have to. <laughs> I hope that helps, Brenda. Okay, Tiffany, what was your question? Was that Tiffany? A couple of comments. Or, okay. Yes, can you hear me? A couple mm -hmm. of comments. First, I just want to say, even though you had a hard coming up in the school system and you were suspended and you were expelled and had to go through all of this, I mean, just on the outside looking in and meeting you for the first time on this phone, I can observe that there's a reason for all of that. And I'm sure you've gone through that in your mind, but yeah. the work that you're doing now is all because of what you went through. So you're able to help not only your son and your daughter, but you're able to advocate for black boys on, you know, on the a bigger scale and help us to do the same. Mm -hmm. um, I've already gone through the school system with my son and I'm breathing sighs of relief because the things that you're talking about, I'm thinking about the people on the call who have the young sons who are in school now and I'm just so grateful that I'm done with that part. But, um, you know, my struggle is a different one at this point. We have different stages and different struggles in this fight. So um, I'm glad to learn, you know, what you're saying and, and it makes uh, the reason that I'm involved so much um, more special because I'm able to to learn about this and help disseminate the information. 
Um, so I just want to commend you for the work that you're doing, and um, I just appreciate so much that you're able to share it. Thank um, you. I did have a – yeah, I had a time with my son. Um, he, was, he was four years old. I put him in a private school, and even before I was really woke, so to speak, I've always had a um, – a thing about making sure that I'm advocating for my son. When I was carrying him, I was a senior in college, and my senior project paper was on making sure that my son would not be labeled in the school system. Because as soon as I became pregnant and I knew I had a son, a black son, that was in my head. I didn't want to be labeled. So it was my job and my, my, my goal from that moment to make sure that didn't happen. And uh, I made sure that when he got to preschool, I was always advocating. But when he got there and the teacher was calling me every two or three days to say, with their little policy, we need you to come and discipline your son. He mm-hmm. looked at another student angrily when we were walking um, down the hall. You know, that mm-hmm. kind of crap. I'm sorry. To, mm-hmm. That's the kind of stuff that makes us angry. And the question that came up just before um, I was able to ask this, um, it it speaks to the same thing I want to say. It makes us so angry that sometimes it's hard for us to step back and say, okay, let me, let me calm down, and before I go and address this teacher, let me get my thoughts together and decide the best way to approach her. Because mm-hmm. we're, we're mama bears. We can't help but not to be defensive, but to, to get angry when somebody is messing with our kids. So we have to, what you're saying about, you know, making sure we speak to them at a certain, in a certain way, it's not fair that we have to do that, but we do have to make sure we are talking to them in a way that's going to get some results. And unfortunately, not condescending, but unfortunately we have to step back in ourselves to be able to do that. And that's, that's a big effort. It's a huge mm-hmm. effort. So all of you who have to do that now, God bless you, and I'll be praying for you <laughs> because I remember when I had to do it, and it wasn't always easy. I'm thanking God that he gave me a, an idea to be, you know, temperate, but... It's not always easy. It's difficult. It's difficult when you're, somebody is messing with your kid. It's um, hard. It's, it's impossible. <laughs> it is very, very difficult because when our children hurt, we hurt, you know, and, and we become mama bears. And, and, and I wonder, and I don't know where that whole angry black woman stereotype comes from, but it probably came from messing with our kids, <laughs> you know. Who knows? But I do, Prince, yes. uh, Tiffany, I want you to go to the suspensionstudy.com and share your experience from when your child was four. Because mm-hmm. so many times, um, one of the reasons we're doing this study is because stories like yours, they're not captured. And the schools now know we're looking at suspension, so they're not reporting it. All of the data that I showed you all, as bad as it is, it came from self-report of the school. So can you imagine how bad it really is? So that's why our study is focusing on getting the information from families. So, Dr. Allen, that's a great point, and um, it just allows us to segue here. Um, really quickly, if some of you don't know, we are working with Dr. Allen on this uh, on the study that she's doing about early childhood education suspensions and expulsions, and um, she we've shared that on inside our, our website. You can uh, click directly into the survey and participate. And um, we, Moms of Black Boys United, will be participating or, or will be working with Dr. Allen on um, sharing the results of the survey with the rest of the world. I mean, these stories that we're all sharing here today um, and that we've heard are, uh, is a great, um, thank you, is a great, uh, you know, learning experience to others. And it's funny because one of her moms said, uh, Dr. Allen, just to kind of, follow up on what you and Tiffany were uh, discussing, she's uh, almost penned, uh, <laughs> penned you and said, uh, you know, she's praying for wisdom because her, her little one is, uh, is getting ready to, uh, to go into that preschool era and she's uh, coined it WWDAS. What would Dr. Allen say? I love it. I love it. <laughs> you, you shared some, some jewels with us today, um, some little pieces of knowledge and even though I myself am out of that, my son is 20, he's older now. Um, but I know for a fact, uh, I've even received messages that there are other moms um, here that uh, know of someone who could use this information. So thank you so much. If you could quickly um, share with us just one or two bites about the survey, um, again, uh, as we close out, uh, that would be wonderful. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm so excited for the survey. It's, it's the first of its kind in our country. I just found out last week that someone's trying to replicate it, but since we're so far into it, we will be able to really distribute our findings first and publish them first. But like I said, all of the data that we receive is by self-report. But this, so there are three points that we want to address in the survey. One is how do parents perceive suspensions and expulsions? So we're hearing from teachers, but what is our experience with it? Two, does it lead to harsh treatment of children, parental harsh treatment? So if you have a family who have to work, a mom who must work, her three-year-old is being sent home from school early every other day, is she saying, boy, you better behave or I'm going to whoop your butt when you get home? You know what I mean? What, how is it impacting that mother-child relationship? Then the third is how is it impacting the workforce? Because many people have their children in early childhood programs so they can work. And if they are being caught home, are they losing their jobs or losing pay or being suspended and things like that? So it's a nationwide survey, and it can be completed on telephones. We're putting it out on Twitter, on all of the social media. We have a website to make it easy for people to go to. It's in English and Spanish. MOP's um, logo is there because they're our partner in this. So once it's released, we will um, – MOP's – we're working together to have a huge launch of the findings. But the biggest concern that I have right now is that mostly white parents are responding. So I'm afraid we're not going to see the true picture. So we need all of you to respond to the survey, to send the survey out to your networks, to really help us to get this out. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen. Once again, we really appreciate you joining the call today, and we'd love to have you back of course, when you have the um, the findings of the study and everyone, as she said, please, please, please spread the word. Also, um, this was posted in chat, but I just wanted to also acknowledge that Dr. Allen was our first founding um, member of Mob United, so we want to thank you for <laughs> your support and belief in us, and we look forward to continuing to, to work with you. So thank you so much. If there are no um, final comments, we're just going to close out with a prayer by Nashiva Starr. You see the star? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we do. Okay, great. So today's prayer is about perseverance because we all know that this fight is about continuing one step at a time. Universal power who has helped me to begin a good work, give me the perseverance to finish it. Let me not be weary in well-doing, for thou hast promised that if I faint not, I shall reap abundantly in due season. When I am tempted to give up anything I have begun, Make me feel that I, if I preserve a little longer, success may come, and that it may be much nearer to me than I think is possible. Fix my eyes on the end, and let me not pay too much attention to the way, lest I grow discouraged. This I pray, this I ask. Amen. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, ladies. Bye. Amen. Thank you. And everyone will be back in two weeks. Uh, Dr. Wood will be on talking about the Black Minds Matters course in two weeks. Have a great weekend.